Hi, welcome to this video on tuples. My name is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley. Tuples are just a simple way of grouping together some data in a light, easy fashion. The data elements it's grouping together don't have names, and we'll see how that works in just a second. Some people pronounce it tuple, and some people pronounce it tuple. Either way is fine. I've even heard people say it both ways in a single sentence. Perhaps they're just hedging their bets. I don't know. The concept of a tuple is common in mathematics and functional programming. Rust is not a functional programming language per se, but it does contain a lot of functional aspects about it, just like a lot of other languages do these days. So why would you want to use a tuple? You can do certain abstract things with tuples, but really, often people use it so that they don't have to create full-fledged data structures to represent their data. If it's obvious what your tuple represents, a developer can just create a simple tuple and save a few keystrokes. Okay, let's get to some coding. I'm gonna create a simple tuple containing an integer and a float. It is defined by parentheses and you simply place the values you want inside. It creates a simple anonymous type. If I hover my mouse over the variable, it will tell you the type. To access your elements, you'll see a number when you press dot at the end of your variable. It's a zero-based indexing, meaning the first element actually starts with zero and goes up from there. Let's print out both elements. And I'll actually run it for kicks and giggles. <laughs> Note you can also print out the entire tuple like this. You have to use the colon and question mark to get this to work. Printing to the terminal or formatting to a string is a more in-depth topic that I discuss in a different video. If the colon and question mark seem weird here, you can refer to that video. Woohoo! There's our full tuple printed out to the terminal. Anyways, you can add more data elements if you like, not just a simple pair. And they can be of completely different types. For example, I'll add a string slice, a string, and a car. If I hover my mouse, it will show me the new tuple type definition. And notice that the dot operator has more numbers now. I can even add tuples to tuples, aka nesting tuples. Let's add a tuple to this type definition that contains two floats. And if I hover my mouse, it will display the type. Notice that the type definition also has the nested parentheses. However, accessing the nested tuple is not as straightforward as you'd think. Since the nested tuple is the last item, you'd think all you need to do is type sumtuple.5.1 to get the second element of the nested tuple, but you get a compile error. I'm not 100% sure why the compiler has issues with this, but there are a couple ways around it. If you put a space in between the five and the one, it will compile. Weird, huh? Why does this work? Pfft, beats me. Be aware that IntelliSense stops working here. If you press dot, no options will pop up. But if I select an item that is not part of the inner tuple, such as index two, it will at least give me a compile error and show that there's an issue. Another way to access the inner tuple is to surround the first part with parentheses, and that will also work. If I were to take a pick, I'd pick the latter, but that's not a hard and fast rule. I don't really like either option, but use whatever you like. A nested tuple can sometimes be useful in situations where you need to be abstract, but for most programmers, I doubt you'll be putting tuples inside of tuples. Okay, let's switch gears and do a little more practical example. I'm gonna clean up a bit. Often a tuple is useful when you have obvious grouping of data. For example, an XY value, or a latitude and longitude, one that I often use is the red, green, and blue of a color. That's extremely common in programming. I'll create a function that will return the tuple representing the red, green, and blue values with U8s, which goes from zero to 255 for each value. With just that little information, we can have more than 16 million distinct colors, uh, some more glamorous than others. Normally you would put some logic in here to determine the color that should be returned. I'm currently getting a compile error because I haven't returned any data, so let's return some hard-coded data for simplicity's sake. I'm not gonna do the actual calculations. 
And now I'm getting a warning because this function is never used. So let's go ahead and do that and put the result into a variable. When I hover my mouse, it knows it's a tuple type with three U8s. Let's print out the green portion of that data, which is the middle element of the RGB corresponding to index one. Okay, let's go ahead and run that. One neat trick you can do is populate multiple variables from a tuple. If you're going to go through the trouble of naming the variables though, I would suggest you're not really saving any keystrokes and you should probably just create a data structure. That's just my opinion though. If I wasn't knowledgeable about how colors are defined, this might be a little cryptic. A zero, one, or two doesn't give much information. I personally know what this stands for, but what about other programmers? Yes, the function name has RGB in it, so that's a pretty big clue, but should you have to go track down the function generating the data in order to know what it represents? What if I wanted to add an alpha to the color, meaning a value representing transparency? Often it's represented by RGBA, where the alpha comes at the end. Let's create a variable with four U8s to represent that. Okay, so that's not that big of a deal, but I've also seen ARGB as well used in programming, meaning the alpha is at the beginning. So does the four UH represent RGBA or ARGB? or some other standard that I'm not even aware of. Adding a fourth U8 to represent alphas throws a monkey wrench into our simple tuple. Your assumption may not be the same as somebody else's assumption, and as soon as that happens, you need to be more explicit about your data type. Okay, I'll stop preaching. One last thing I want to discuss is the empty tuple, or unit tuple as it's sometimes called. It's just two parentheses with nothing in it. If I hover my mouse over the variable, you'll see that the type is defined as empty parentheses, meaning an empty tuple. Sometimes you'll see this at the end of match statements, whenever you don't want to do anything for that branch. Let me do a real quick example so you can see what I mean. Also, if you have a procedure, it's actually a function that returns an empty tuple. If I create a dummy procedure and try to return something, the error message will say that it's expecting an empty tuple, but found an integer. So you'll see empty tuples more often than you might think. When you see empty parentheses in a type definition or being used in some code, those are empty tuples. To sum up, tuples are a simple, easy way to group data together and can save you a few keystrokes. It can also make some abstract coding easier. But be careful, as other developers will have to read your code it may not always be obvious what your data represents. Yeah, you can put some naming on your variable or function to better describe it, but as soon as you're doing that, it's almost to the point where it's better to make a full-fledged data type to describe your data. It's a judgment call. Lastly, we briefly touched upon empty tuples. Thank you for watching this video. My name is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley, and I'll see you next time.